this morning, um, I'd like to, uh, I guess, blaze some new territory for me personally. It's something that I have been studying for the last couple of years, um, but I've held off on kind of diving into it because I wanted to have a little bit more information, be able to, what they say, dot the I's and cross the T's a little bit. Um, it's still a process that I'm going through of learning these things, but I'm very excited about some of the things that I'd like to share with you. So before we get started, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we come to approaching your throne, um, knowing that you are a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And we pause to give you the respect and the reverence that you so richly deserve. You are the God of the universe, and the truths in your word are transforming in our lives. We thank you for your love, we thank you for your grace, we thank you for your mercy and your long-sufferingness toward us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary, to be raised again on the third day, so that we have absolute assurance that if we have put our faith and trust in his finished work on that cross, that we too will rise one day and spend all of eternity in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you have done. We pray now that as we open your word, that you would give me clarity, uh, that you would help me to speak clearly of the things that you would want, and uh, that it would be a blessing to those who are in attendance, and that all of us together would rejoice as we learn more of your word and more of who you are. Thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The overarching title that I have given to this session, and Lord willing, one or two more sessions after this, um, is called, I've entitled, The Next Exodus. The Next Exodus. And I hope that just those three words will intrigue you. We aren't going to be dealing with a lot of things related specifically to the next exodus in this session, but what I'll be sharing with you is foundational for us to springboard into further discussions of this particular subject, the next exodus. But I've still given this session today that umbrella uh, title, if you will, because I believe that this, what we're sharing with you today is so important for a further understanding and a deeper understanding of what is to come. Essentially what I'm looking to do today is to have an eye towards the future, biblical prophecy and what is coming, but to, in order to more fully understand what is coming is to start you in the Old Testament and then move backwards to the beginning of the story, if you will, so that we have a deeper understanding of the foundation upon which the promised Messiah would come. So we understand the framework out of which uh, God brought him and what he will do in the future. So the phrase, we're going back to the future, that's what we're doing today. <laughs> we're going back so that we can more fully understand the future. So the subtitle, if you will, for this session is The Battle of Gog and the Oracles of Balaam. And that may be perplexing to you as well, and I'm assuming as we go into this that many of you who have been coming to these sessions have some understanding, particularly when we talk about the Battle of Gog, but we'll go into a little more detail, uh, specifically in Ezekiel chapter 38. But the second portion of the title, the Oracles of Balaam, that may raise some questions in your mind, and you say, what is this, some kind of pagan, you know, strange thing that's going on, the Oracles of Balaam. Do you remember Balaam from the Old Testament, he's famous for having a pet, a donkey, and the donkey spoke to him. That's the guy, Balaam, okay? So we're going to go back to that in a little while, but I want to start at 
the battle of Gog in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, why do I start in Ezekiel 38? I start here because one of the emphases that we will be looking at today is the Antichrist. This arch enemy, if you will, of Israel and ultimately nemesis of, you could say, Jesus Christ in the final analysis, this individual Gog, who is he? And I take you to Ezekiel chapter 38 because really it's known as the premier text as it relates to understanding Gog and who many believe is to be the Antichrist. Now, there are scholars who hold to different views, and there are many scholars who do not believe that Gog, mentioned, G-O-G, mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, is the Antichrist. There are many scholars who believe that this whole series of events in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a battle that will take place under a different leader, that Gog is not the Antichrist, that he is a different leader, and many hold to the position that these conflicts that you're seeing in Ezekiel 38 and 39 will take place prior to the arrival of the Antichrist. They will take place earlier, and these battles will set the stage, if you will, in Israel and the Middle East for the Antichrist to appear. And so there are many who believe that that's, that's the case. I strongly believe that that is not accurate, and that Gog, mentioned here in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, is a reference clearly to the Antichrist. And as we go through today, um, I think and I believe that you will, you will concur as I think we reveal some of the evidence um, of that. That's not the primary issue that we're focused on, but it is one that is important as, in terms of what we're looking at as we go through um, this study. So Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. So let's take a look just to set the stage because I want to uh, put us in the context of what we're speaking of here in Ezekiel 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma, of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. So if you've been here with us in previous sessions or you've been studying these, uh, this portion of scripture in the past, um, you may have uh, heard us refer to a lot of these places. These are mostly tribal names. And these tribal names primarily were located originally in the area of what we know today as Turkey. So when you're reading Meshach, Tubal, uh, Tagarma, uh, those are areas specifically tribal names, grandsons of uh, Noah, if you will, and they were in the area what we know today as Turkey or historically as Asia Minor. But they're not alone. So this individual that, and remember, God is orchestrating all of these things for his purposes. He is pulling these nations and these leaders to fulfill his concept, his plan for the ultimate redemption of humanity but he has purposes in the land of Israel and he wants to see those purposes fulfilled and he's using nations just as he has done historically. He has used other nations to bring judgment upon his people, Israel, throughout history. When they have strayed from him, when they walked away from his word, when they fell into idolatry and paganism, throughout human history, the story in the Bible is how uh, Israel, they, they worshiped the Lord. They were listening to the words of the prophets. They were adhering to it for a while. And then they fell away. They slipped away. They slipped into idolatry. They slipped into paganism. And they rebelled against God, their creator. Israel had a unique privilege that they had God, the God of the universe, the God of creation, dwelling in their midst. He was the, they were his people. 
But they rebelled, and through history, God brought judgment upon them by using various nations around them to accomplish his purposes, to bring judgment, but never with the idea that he lost his love and affection and that he would forego his covenant promises to them. That was always in view, but it was to correct, it was to right the ship, if you will. But those judgments with those nations coming in against Israel, some of them were very, very harsh. So we're reading here at the end, and here we see that Gog, this individual, is coming down. He's gonna be coming down, you'll see here in a few verses, into Israel. But it says in verse four, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth all of thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company of them. And you know who's gonna be with them? Persia, Iran of today, Ethiopia, most likely what we know today is Sudan, and Libya to the west of Egypt, nations in North Africa. So Israel will have, will be attacked from the north under the direction of Gog, this individual, I believe is the Antichrist, and he will have many nations with him, and nations not only from Israel's north, but from Israel's south, from all around, from east as well. Iran, North Africa, to the north, most likely Turkey and some of the um, uh, uh, Islamic republics in that area as well. Verse seven, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, let me ask you a question. This is very important. When you're reading this text, specifically verse eight, in the latter years, you're gonna be coming up against a people, he's saying to, the, to Gog, the leader, I believe the Antichrist, you're gonna be invading a land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered, these people are gathered out of many nations and brought back against the mountains of Israel, living there in Israel, which before were laid waste, and they're dwelling in safety. Do you remember that just a chapter before, Ezekiel is given a vision of dry bones? And that vision of dry bones is there's all these dry bones around and, and, and Ezekiel's posed with a question, can these bones live? And the bones start coming together, bone upon bone, sinew upon sinew, muscle, flesh, to become an exceeding great people, army. This is a reference in Ezekiel 37, the dry bones of Israel coming back to form a nation, a people again. So they're living, if you look, they're living in safety. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil, verse 12, and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered, here it is again, out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? Most likely Sheba and Dedan are referring to Saudi Arabia and they're watching as the king of the north, Gog, the Antichrist comes down and enters into Israel. Further to the south of Israel is Saudi Arabia, most likely Sheba and Dedan and maybe Jordan is in that mix with Saudi Arabia and is looking and is seeing that. Are you coming, Gog, Antichrist? Are you coming to take a spoil and to take a prey? 
the merchants of Tarshish, most, li most likely those are the merchants from afar, from distant lands, who are traveling on the sea lanes, possibly the Red Sea. Are you coming to take a spoil, to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? You're going to know, Gog, that they're dwelling safely without walls. Verse 15, and thou shalt come from thy place, where? Out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now here's where I want you to key on. Verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time? by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? So ladies and gentlemen, here in verse 17, after Ezekiel is given this vision and he's prophesying, in verse 17, there's a, there's a pause, if you will, and a comment that's very, very critical to understanding the text. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he? And now, who, who is he saying he? Art thou he? He's talking to Gog. Gog, G-O-G, who we're saying is the Antichrist. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou Gog, he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years ago? that I would bring thee, Gog, up against my people? So the question is, where? Where did God, through his servants and prophets, where did he speak and through whom did he speak about this individual, Gog, who will be Israel's greatest ultimate nemesis who will arise in the last days and who will invade Israel. Who spoke of Gog and where and what was the context? For that, let's go back to the oracles of Balaam. The oracles of Balaam. So turn with me, if you will, Back to Numbers chapter 20. We'll start in 22. And the question is, can we, through scripture, find, discover the texts where God's servants, the prophets, spoke about this individual who would come and eventually who will be defeated, but the one who will come up against Israel only to be defeated by the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he returns to earth. So let me give you some context now, knowing that that's, what our, that's where we're focused on, that's where we're going, but we're now in back, back in Numbers, for the time being, chapter 22, because we want to recount to you briefly the story of Balaam and what happened um, in this story. In the context here, the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt were led out during the time of the Exodus by Moses, and they were traveling in the wilderness. They got to the point, to the borders of the area of uh, Edom and Moab, and they requested to travel through. And they sent a message ahead, Moses did, and said, listen, we just want to pass through. We're not looking to take your water. We're not looking to take your cattle. Uh, we're not looking to take your crops. 
No one will do that. We will just pass through and we'll keep to ourselves. And they were told, you shall not pass. So the children of Israel who have been through so much enslaved in Egypt, and Moses recounts that in his request, they're denied traveling through that area. And so they end up going other places. They don't pass through because they're denied entry to, to pass through. And remember, they're on their way to the promised land, right? That was the route. So they're denied entry through. And so they end up wandering in other places. And the Canaanites uh, attack them and took some of them captive, the Israelites. And they... Uh, beseeched Moses and the Lord and said, we will destroy all of the Canaanite cities if the Lord will be with us. Um, we will destroy, we will um, not keep anything alive, and God gives them the victory. And then they go to some other locations, and it's itemized, it's listed in the book of Numbers where the Israelites go, and they are conquering as they go. They're winning in each of these battles. God is with them. So now they are encamped a time, much, uh, a time later, they're encamped in the area now of Moab. And they're across from Jericho, near the Jordan River, in the plateau of Moab. The problem is that the king of Moab, Balak, is very concerned that he has this massive group of people that are camped out on the plains of Moab, and he's concerned about resources. He's concerned and he even sends a, a message to the king of the Midianites. And he says, these people like oxen are going to lick up all the, all the grass. They're going to take all the resources. And he also knows that Israel has just decimated the Amorites. And so the king of Moab and the Moabites are very concerned that they're up next. And so the king, Balak, he summons a diviner, if you will, someone who prophesies about the future. And that individual's name is Balaam. His name is Balaam. So he calls, he calls Balaam and he, he sends messengers and he summons this Balaam to come. And the reason that he wants him to come is he says, I want you to cast a curse on the Israelites. Put a curse on them. And he's willing to pay handsomely for Balaam to come and to give him honor and respect within the Moabite kingdom. And the Moabite uh, uh, people go to him and the messengers and they request and Balaam isn't going to come uh, at first and then uh, is summoned again. Balak goes, finally, finally Balaam comes because the Lord says, if they come to you, to Balaam, if they come to you and they ask you to go in the, in the night, you can go with them. But that didn't happen in the next morning. Balaam gets up on his own, saddles his donkey, and he goes off with them. And the Lord, and he's about to, to, to go with them, and the Lord is very angry with Balaam. And here is Balaam riding on a donkey, and the donkey sees an angel of the Lord with a sword. And the donkey says, I'm, you know, I'm not, I can't go that way. There's, you know, there's danger. And the donkey stops and then goes off into a field. And Balaam is very angry with the donkey and brings him back. And then he's going through a vineyard with walls on both sides. And once again, the angel of the Lord with a sword appears and the donkey pushes to the side and crushes the foot of Balaam on the wall. And Balaam is angry once again. And finally, it happens a third time, and the donkey just squats down. I don't know if he threw Balaam off or he just got down and wouldn't go. And Balaam is angry. And he hears, his eyes are finally opened because the donkey speaks. The Lord empowers the donkey to speak to him. It says, hey, I've been your donkey all along. Have I ever led you astray before? Have I ever, have I ever disobeyed you before? I've been a good pet. I've been a good donkey. And, and, and Balaam, um, finally, it's revealed to him where he sees what the donkey sees, which is the angel of the Lord and the sword of the Lord. And he understood 
from what he was told that had the donkey not stopped, the donkey would have been spared, but Balaam would have been killed. So Balaam follows the Lord's request, and he's told, he says, I will allow you to go to Balak, king of Moab, but you are only to tell him what I reveal to you. You're only to tell him what I say, nothing else. And so Balaam agrees. To make a long story short, Balak, king of Moab, says, hey, I want you to curse the children of Israel. And he takes Balaam to a location up high, it says, where they sacrificed to Baal, the false god. And then they call for seven altars, and they offer sacrifices on those seven altars. And Balaam is, says, I need to hear what the Lord has to say to me so that I have something to share with you. And he comes back after he hears from the Lord, and he's actually blessing. He pronounces a blessing upon Israel. And Balak, is, the king of Moab, is extremely upset because it was exactly the opposite of what he wanted to see happen. This happens three times. And what's amazing is they didn't quite get the answer they were looking for in the first location, so they changed locations to another location to see, let's offer some more sacrifices there, and we'll look, and they were looking at the children of Israel encamped in these, in these areas from a distance. So they didn't get the, the, the cursing that they were hoping for, so they said, let's change locations and go over here and sacrifice a little more and try it again, see if we get a better result. But each time, God gave Balaam a blessing to pronounce upon Israel and a cursing, if you will, against Balak and Moab. Certainly not the result that the king of Moab was looking for. I'll go back to verse 30 of chapter 23. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. This was the, this was the third and final time. So this is the third location. Um, they're offering... Uh, on these altars, they're offering a bullock and a ram as a sacrifice. But now, chapter 24, verse 1. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam, this diviner, this seer of the future, lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said which he heard the words of God which saw the vision of the Almighty. It's very clear who he's getting this from. He's getting it from God from the Almighty. And he makes it very clear. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are the tents of Jacob and thy tabernacles, O Israel! As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. And Balak's anger, this is the king of Moab, was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto a great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, 
Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. So this is the encounter that they had, and this is the third time, and this is the final oracle that Balaam here is given, and it was different than the other ones in that he didn't seek enchantments. He turned and he faced the wilderness. Now look what it says, because we're going to unpack this a little bit. He says, how goodly, verse 5, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles of Israel. Now what I want to point out to you here in the next few verses is I want to point out to you the messianic language or the alluding to of a messianic concept. Now, I don't mean eluding like an illusion. Allude like refer back to, okay? So there is, there is language that is used here in the text, and it's very under, important that you understand. This language has messianic components to it. It's, it has uh, the feel of messianic dialogue, if you will. But it's not just a feel that we have. You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that ancient Israel understood the text. They understood the books of Moses. They understood what was, what was given before by Moses. They knew their history. They understood what the servant of the Lord had said. And each prophet that came along after another built upon what the foundation that had already been laid before by the servants of God and by the prophets. So by the time you get to this text in Numbers chapter 24, the language that is used here was familiar to the Jewish people, to the Israelites. It was familiar to them. And I'm going to show it to you, and it goes back to the book of Genesis. So the first messianic language component that we're going to be focusing on is tents. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Israel's tents. And we're going to go back in just a moment to Genesis chapter 9, verse 27. But I want to keep reading here. As the valleys, verse 6, are they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. So the question is, is Balaam in this prophecy turning, it says, to the wilderness and seeing all of the tent encampments of the Israelites? Is he seeing that and just describing what he's seeing? All of the tents of Israel, all arrayed in maybe a huge valley, and then he's describing all of these things? That's not most likely what is in view here. Yes, he was looking at the encampments of Israel, but the language has a messianic component to it. Go back to Genesis chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. This is in the, this is in the context of Noah's sons, and specifically one son's grandson is mentioned here. His name is Canaan. The text says, And he said... Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now look at this next verse. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Remember Noah had three sons? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. What is, what is in view here, folks, is the three sons of Noah, specifically. Canaan was a grandson, but it's essentially the three sons. And there's a pronouncement made on where the lineage of the promised Messiah would come through. And what's being said here is, yeah, God shall enlarge Japheth, but God shall dwell in the tents of Shem. 
and Canaan shall be his servant. The emphasis here is on Shem. Very, very important. So the lineage goes through Shem. Now, let's take a look back at Numbers chapter 24. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Why is he saying that? As Balaam is looking out and prophesying, he's, what he's saying is, you, Israel, have an amazing privilege by the fact that the God of creation dwells in your midst. He is dwelling in your midst. He is within your tents. You have a privilege unlike any of the nations surrounding you that God himself dwells in your midst. Verse six, as the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of lime aloes which the Lord hath planted and as cedar trees beside the waters. In ancient times, when language was used to describe the presence of a deity, many times they used language that would allude to gardens or lush locations or riversides or the strength of trees. So here in the context, what what Balaam is saying is, as he looks out at the encampment of Israel, you have the presence of Almighty God in your midst. He dwells among you. And look at what he has done to provide blessing to you. So now, look at the next passage. Verse 7. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. So the messianic language that is being used here is referring to Israel's seed. Where does that go back to also in the book of Genesis? Genesis chapter three, verse 15. And I will put enmity, God says, between thee and the woman. This is, he's talking to Satan here who tempted Adam and Eve to sin in the garden. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the context here, going back to Numbers chapter 24 in this messianic language, he shall pour the water out of his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters. What does it mean his seed shall be in many waters? First of all, you should know that the usage of the word seed here is singular. It is singular. His seed shall be in many waters. Do you know what the Bible uses as language for a kingdom? It's almost like you have a, a country that, that um, or your, your realm of influence is from sea to shining sea. The idea is a kingdom over the earth over many waters, your influence, whoever this seed will be, will have influence and power over the nations, over many waters, is the idea. Again, clear messianic language that goes back to Genesis chapter three, verse 15. Remember, folks, the whole issue, the primary purpose, specifically after Genesis chapter three, is to identify who the Messiah will be and where he's gonna come from. So Genesis 3.15 talks about the seed that will come and the rest of Genesis, and you can say beyond, is trying to identify for us where the promised seed, who he would be and where he'll come from. So here you get in Numbers chapter 24 in the Oracle of Balaam, and he says, Israel, your tents are blessed. You are blessed because you have the divine presence in your midst through the line of Shem. The passage we looked at about God dwelling in the tents of Shem, the Israelites. So he's dwelling in their midst, and then it says, his seed shall be in many waters. This coming seed, this one who was promised in Genesis 3.15, 
who will be the ultimate Messiah, Redeemer of Israel, Deliverer, he's going to have a kingdom over the earth, over many waters. Let's keep looking. As a reminder, let's look at the lineage of Adam and Eve. Remember, Eve gives birth to Cain and Abel. Cain murders Abel. But then God gives Eve another son. His name is Seth. From Seth comes Noah. And from Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And remember, we saw in the text that God's dwelling will be in the tents of Shem. Okay? So here in the oracle, later in Numbers chapter 24, Balaam's oracle is hearkening back to that very issue that God's presence will be in the tents of Shem, Israel, as he's looking out over the encampments in the wilderness. And then he says, your seed, his seed, will be over many waters. He's going to have a grand kingdom. Now, what does he say beyond in Numbers chapter 24, verse 7? He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed, singular, shall be in many waters, and his king, singular, shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So here's the messianic language once again in Numbers chapter 24. Israel's king, Israel's king. And that goes back to what the Israelites would have known back in Genesis chapter 49. What's the text? The scepter, kingship, shall not depart from Judah. So it was from the tribe of Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh. And Shiloh, scholars debate as to what it means. It really means until the one whose it belongs to comes, is the idea. The one who, to whom it belongs comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So here in Genesis 49, again the book of Genesis, Jewish people, Israelites, would have understood those mess, that messianic language that was used in the oracle of Balaam. Hearkening back to kingship, this seed that would come from Genesis 3.15 he will be king and he will come from the tribe of Judah. So let's look again at the lineage. From Shem, remember, God dwells in the tents of Shem. Israel had God's presence and blessing. Through Shem comes Terah. From Terah, Abraham. From Abraham, Isaac. Through Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac gives, has Jacob as a son. And then Jacob has 12 sons, and the Bible tells us, Genesis 49.10, the scepter or kingship of Israel shall not depart from the tribe of Judah. And then we know beyond this that from Judah eventually comes King David, and from King David, Jesus the Messiah. So now let's go back to the text. You saw the lineage and you saw the messianic language. Let's keep going in Numbers chapter 24, verse 7. He shall pour the water out of his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters and his king shall be higher than Agag. Now you see what I have on the screen? It's not in your Bible. There are square brackets to show that it's, I added it. So, and his Israel's King, the Messiah, shall be higher than Agag, Gog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Now, the translation, and I want you to stick with me here, the translation of the word Agag, the name Agag, is questioned. And here's some of the reason and justification for why it's questioned. Yes, Agag was a king. Uh, he was an Amalekite king. He lived during the time of Saul, King David, and Samuel. And King David, during his monarchy, defeated King Agag. That is true. However, in the context 
of what is being said here and the messianic language that is being used that we just highlighted for you, there have been some who have questioned the translation agog, should it be gog? Now here's the reason. In the, and don't, I don't wanna get too technical, but I have to give you some justification. In the, the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, Okay, the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, it's translated Agag, okay? But that is one of the only places where it's translated Agag in the Masoretic text. And that is important. The Masoretic text is, is an excellent source. It is a major source and it is a go-to source um, for, and, and if we did not have it, we would be lacking a lot of understanding as it relates to the scriptures in terms of um, the specific text. However, there are several other reliable sources. Uh, the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. Uh, the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, has it as Gog, G-O-G. The Samaritan Pentateuch, which is, when you say Penta is five, it's equivalent to, you'd say, the Torah, okay? The Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, or the Torah. The Samaritan Pentateuch, which was one of the oldest translations still in existence um, that we have today of the Old Testament, also has it as Gog, G-O-G. And also uh, Theodotion and Symmachus, which were Greek translations of the Old Testament in some of their versions, also have it as Gog. So when you have this many reputable sources, it causes scholars to question the Hebrew Masoretic text because there are certain places um, where they question some of these things based on, and this is one of those places where there is a major question as to whether the translation is Agag or Gog because there are several very reputable sources that say that the translation should be Gog. And I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is not just an academic exercise. Because if we can identify Numbers chapter 24 and the Oracle of Balaam as referring to the ultimate enemy of Israel, as Gog in a clearly messianic context, this gives us amazing insight, which we have not been able to gather elsewhere to show us not only what the nemesis or the arch enemy of God's people will be in the final last days, but we will also gain amazing information as we move on in this study as to what Jesus Christ will do when he returns to the earth. You see, most of us have the impression that when Jesus Christ returns, he's gonna come in the clouds and he's going to rapture believers and those who, have dead in, who are dead in Christ will rise, rise first and we will be with the Lord forever. And I don't look to diminish that in any way, but what Jesus Christ will be doing when he comes back the second time is far, far more than simply what I just described to you. There is a whole series of events on earth that Jesus Christ will be accomplishing when he returns, not as little Jesus, meek and mild, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but as the warrior king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. When he returns, ladies and gentlemen, there are many things that he will accomplish during that period of time. It's not just an instantaneous ending. There are lots of things that he will accomplish. So let's continue to read just for the moment. Verse eight, God brought him forth out of, what's the next word? Egypt. Egypt. God brought him forth out of Egypt. Now, look back with me, stay with me, one chapter, Numbers chapter 23, Numbers chapter 23, verse 22. Because this, is an, this was an earlier oracle of Balaam in the story. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 22, almost identical language. And what's said? God brought them 
out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, which means the strength of a wild ox. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? What has God done? Behold, verse 24, behold, the people, plural, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Ladies and gentlemen, almost the identical language in the previous chapter, but the descriptions using pronouns are plural in that one. That oracle was referring to the exodus under Moses that the children of Israel had come through. It's referring to what Moses did leading the children of Israel under God's divine plan out of Egypt and how they would come through and they would destroy some of the enemies that would come against them as they were wandering in the wilderness. However, when you get to the last oracle of Balaam, the pronouns change in the almost identical language to singular, singular. So the tense of Israel, they have the presence of God in them, the divine presence, because they're the line of which the Messiah would one day come. And then we read about the seed, a singular seed who will have a kingdom over the waters, over the nations. And then we read, and his king, singular, shall be higher than, I would say, Gog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. The Messiah's kingdom shall be exalted. So now we get to verse 8. God brought him forth out of Egypt. So if you didn't know what I just explained to you, you might think it's a duplicate of the previous chapter where the pronouns were plural. Speaking of Israel coming out of Egypt under Moses. But here in the next oracle in chapter 24, almost the same language, but the pronouns are singular, referring to Israel's ultimate Messiah. So what must that indicate to us if in the next verse we read Numbers 24, 8, God brought him forth out of Egypt. I'm going to tease you, but I'm going to leave it here. Where will the Messiah come from when he returns to earth the second time? And who is a type of the Messiah from this earlier text? Is there an individual who is a type of Christ who led Israel out of captivity from Egypt through the wilderness? but was unsuccessful due to his failure to follow God's instruction and only got to look across at the promised land, but was never allowed to lead his people into the promised land to establish a kingdom on the earth. So when Jesus Christ returns as the warrior king to redeem his people, one last time, where do you think he may come from? If he's a type, if Moses was a type or an illustration of what Jesus Christ will do when he returns, ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be another exodus. And I will leave it there until the next time. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, 
you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.